Welcome to the Industrial Talk Podcast with Scott McKenzie. Scott is a passionate industry professional dedicated to transferring cutting-edge, industry-focused innovations and trends while highlighting the men and women who keep the world moving. So put on your hard hat, grab your work boots, and let's go. Hi, it's Scott McKenzie, and thank you for joining the Industrial Talk podcast. And uh, this week, we've got a gentleman by the name of John Grubbs. He is a uh, speaker, definitely a speaker, and uh, author. And his latest book is Leading the Lazy, Getting the Most from Today's Workforce, as well as Leadership Among Idiots. Catchy, catchy t- titles. But uh, he's a friend. He's a great professional. And after this podcast, he's going to be your friend. So without wasting your time, because I'm all about time, here's John Grubbs. Well, I'm pleased to announce that uh, I've got a gentleman by the name of Mr. John Grubbs uh, for this episode of the Industrial Talk podcast. I'm so glad he made time in his schedule to be able to be with us. And uh, I think he's going to be uh, sharing with us a lot of great uh, information. And I think that uh, you're going to enjoy it. Hey, welcome, John. Hey, Scott. Good to be here. It's good to have you here. We're using technology. He's not here here physically, but he is there here technically. So it's all very all right. good stuff. For our listeners, John, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I am a humble East Texas boy that uh, has written a few books and uh, been, been yeah, honored six. to... Six books. Uh, <laughs> I've been honored to to get a little bit of a message that people are starting to resonate with and starting to, I think, make some make some traction in the management space. Now, you know, that that you've you've encapsulated it quite quickly. You you've got a lot more experience there, Mr. John. But uh, here's the deal: How did you find yourself focusing on? I mean, you, your your books are about leadership. You you are a uh, a keynote speaker, best selling author, all that good stuff. How did you get to that point? Well, it's interesting. I started my career in human resources and occupational safety, and and both of those threw me yelling, kicking, and screaming into the world of training and development. And uh, from that role, I started, you know, getting in front of audiences. I started uh, spending time with groups. Fell in love with training and development. Decided that was the direction I wanted to go. And slowly, the audience uh, got a little bigger, and people wanted me to provide a message on topics that started having more and more to do with leadership. And I think it was about 2004 that I had my epiphany moment, my uh, my moment of, of significant change in life. I had someone ask me if I was a leadership expert. And I told that individual, I said, whoa, whoa, I don't know if I wear that title very well at all. I think I'm better described as a student of leadership, someone who really likes to study and analyze why people choose to follow others and why some don't. Uh, but that moment was what really defined my purpose in life. It made me decide that if I'm going to talk in front of groups, I needed to have a leadership perspective, uh, something that I could call my own. And when I looked through all of the research that I had done, I really fell in love with the model of servant leadership. So if you ask me my leadership philosophy, it is based upon the upside down pyramid that when we yeah. say yes to a leadership job, we are in a position of service. The... um. Now, I would imagine you were with a company at the time, and then somebody said, hey, you're a leader, and then you made the decision that said, I be one, and then now I am going to break away from that typical model, that um, employment model, and now I'm going to create my own business. What, what? Tell me about that. That's a big decision. Well, that was that was another one of those moments in life that, that, that is scary. It's it's humbling, but uh, I was working for a large steel mill. Uh, we had 2,500 employees. I ended up uh, in charge of the training and development for that organization. And as I did more and more training, I started realizing that, you know, the value that I'm adding for this organization might benefit me in the private world. So I, I, I took a leap. I prayed about it a lot with my wife. We talked about it and decided that if I were going to do this, you know, I was in my early 30s. I better do it now. So we took the leap. Yeah, that's courageous. I'm telling you, that's a that's a big decision. Did you, now, as your wife, uh, that was always uh, – I did the same thing. I, I made the decision that I needed to take a leap of faith and have that conversation with my wife. And and uh, that's always uh, 
enjoyable, sort of. Yeah. But anyway, it, it, but it's it's proven to be a good decision, and and I know that you are impacting a lot of people. I see you out there. You've got a plenty of social platforms out there. Now, you you primarily focus on let's say managers, management, but but. Tell me a little bit about your philosophy when it comes to leadership. Well, you know, it's really interesting. A lot of people profess to be servant leaders, but when you take and list the two characteristics side by side, many people realize that that servant leaders are are not as common as many people think they are. You know, we're more traditional leaders rather than servant leaders. And tell and, me, tell just briefly explain the difference between the servant versus the quote traditional leader. So a traditional leader has the obligation to take a an organization, could be a small organization, could be a large organization, in a certain direction, and they feel like they're contribution to that organization is the most important part of getting it from where it currently is to where it wants to be. A true servant leader sees themselves as the creators of success within the organization through others. In other words, the, the analogy I like to use in my in, in one of my books is the, it's called the, the Paul Paul Farmer analogy, named after my late father who passed away in 07. But uh, in that book, I compare every step of leadership to farming, from picking the right seeds being analogous to picking the right people, all the way through to what happens when uh, the farmer doesn't pick certain plants or fruit that the plant offers, the plant stops producing. Well, that same analogy works when some leaders or managers don't appreciate the work people do, they stop producing as well. So that that theme of servant leadership is carried all the way through that chapter in that book, even from the, you know, the wisdom of the past. I, I talk about how you can take and till the soil of the, the plants of the past into the soil. That's where you find value from your older employees, your more experienced employees, so that, you know, you don't discount their wisdom because they're at, you know, the twilight of their career. You you enhance that and bring that experience back for the newer employees. How do you how do you take that philosophy of servant leadership and go into an organization? Because I would imagine you you typically battle the quote traditional leadership because, well, we're we're in essence trained in in our education to to be certain we manage a certain way. That's in our colleges and our university, and that's how we do it. How do you transition an organization? Or I know that's a bigger question, but how do you how do you get them to realize that servant leaders? produce um, better results because of what that represents how do you how do you get them to think that way yeah we're we're really struggling we're fighting a huge paradigm you know that the, the paradigm exists because of management which was created in the early 1900s with industrialization uh, I think th- the best way for me to explain it to you is Daniel Pink wrote a book called drive that I think is the epitome mm-hmm. of what I do from a servant leadership approach. You know, he said management 1.0 or motivation 1.0 is our need to to survive, our, our basic human needs. He said motivation 2.0 is management. The world of management as we know it, which we're all comfortable with that model. He said motivation 3.0 is what he refers to as intrinsic motivation. So I spend the big part of my time helping managers make that connection in their mind that you know, if we're if we're doing this management thing thing the same way we did a hundred years ago, there's probably an opportunity to change, improve, or get better. So I help them identify, you know, what's the way to build intrinsic motivation into our organization, especially when the job's not sexy, because some jobs are just not fun to do. So you have to have a bigger purpose, a calling. I call it a tribe in my new book. Uh, so it's it's having them w- wake up and realize, okay, I need to do something different. I think that's the biggest. Uh, biggest contribution I try to make with organizations that I serve. But you probably, your, your best results happen. Um, it's one thing your mid-level ma- manager saying, gosh, I want to be a servant leader. But there's really no support from the top. So your the, the, the epiphany has to come from top saying there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a, a, a difference in how we manage our business. Is that not accurate? Yeah, yeah, yeah that, it's always easier that way, but, but sometimes you can create success, you know, organizationally 
the way I, the way I talk about it, if a, if a certain plant is finding success, let's say a company owns three plants, three manufacturing centers, and one plant seems to be doing something that is more successful or different from the other two, you know, I, I use that platform as a way of helping whoever the CEO of the organization is realize that, you know, we're doing something differently in this plant. That's why the success or the results you're seeing are unusual. So you're, you're also taking in that analogy of the three plants and you're, you're going to have to come up with a general metrics of, of performance based off of whatever key things and saying, okay, plant A is five and, and plant, you know, B and so on are sevens. And what's, what's happening between those two plants and then be able to, uh, identify possibly a gap or a solution. Is that, I mean, you're, you've got to come up with data that is relevant. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll give you a, a really literal example. Um, 10 years ago, I started working with uh, an organization similar to what I described, three large facilities. And we started using the model of servant leadership to impact safety. And, you know, it, it's very metric driven. Uh, when when that organization first engaged, they were experiencing 70 something OSHA recordables a year. Um, that was in 2007. In 2012, they had seven OSHA recordables in that year. So in that five-year period, that represents a 90% reduction in injuries. Uh, and, and senior management said, wow, what's, what's different about this organization? And when we started drilling down, we identified that plant manager is truly a servant leader. He embraced all of the things that we worked on from the beginning. Uh, it, it wasn't a casual embracement. It was a literal embracement. He said, I really want to run my plant this way. So yeah, there are metrics are often derived from the plant, not from me. I help them identify their own metrics that they want to accomplish. Yeah. You didn't have to get buy-in on that too. You know, it's just like maybe somebody over here, Sherry likes this particular data point, but Tom over here likes this one, but have to come to an, an agreement that, that this is, this is the, this is the data and these are the reasons why. Now, if if I was a manager and 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 what your message to me and uh, regarding servant leaders and being a servant leader, what where would you direct me into that education outside of going to johngrubs dot com and finding your books? What, what how did you come across saying I want to be a servant leader? Well, I, I you know th there's tons of leadership books out there, and and that's why even with my own books, I'm starting to drill them down. It's not about the books. I think I think this platform that you and I are having, this discussion that we're having, yeah. is is a great space for people to understand that migration. Uh, I could you know tons of books, but the book itself is not. It, it's more of a platform for speaking. Speaking, I guess. But, but do you think that? Uh, and, uh, hold on, I, I've got to take a break. Uh, I've got uh, Mr. John Grubbs here. He is the all-around great guy. He's inside uh, uh, leadership, servant leadership. When we come on back, we're going to expand a little bit upon that servant leadership. We're going to come up with some three points that uh, you can take to the bank. And uh, I really am glad that you are here. Thank you very much for joining the Industrial Talk podcast. And we will be right back. Hey, once again, this is Scott McKenzie with Industrial Talk. If you like what you're listening to, please feel free to sign up for the free podcast as well as the blogs. I'll try to keep it all relevant to your business and uh, hopefully be able to provide some insight into what we do at Industrial Talk and what you do as a professional. Hope to see you soon. Thank you. We're back. Thank you very much for joining the Industrial Talk Podcast. Once again, I'm here with Mr. John Grubbs, uh, all-around great author, incredible books in leadership. And we were talking prior to the break about servant leadership and the importance of that. And, uh, of course, the, the impact that servant leadership has on the organization. Now, granted, there's going to be challenges right there John with any any change with an organization and I, I got to tell you in the industrial space where these companies have been around for ever and and to affect some change have you seen any challenges within the industrial space on trying to affect these management changes you know 
a couple of weeks ago, I was working with an organization and I was meeting with the, the, the plant manager and he said, you know, we cannot find good people. We cannot find people. Uh, that is our biggest, you know, challenge. And then I, I, I met with another plan and another CEO and another leader. And it, it keeps getting replayed over and over and over that we can't find people. This weekend I was watching a television show and it's all about, you know, where are the jobs? Where, where are the jobs? People can't find jobs. And, you know, I made the connection. I said, there is, there is a huge disconnect between the reality that exists and the perceptions that people believe are out there when it comes to work. You know, there was a guy that I was talking to over the weekend. He said, he said, I am maxed out for the next three months. I have a construction business. He said, I can't take any more work. I said, you're going to have to stop working in your business and start working on your business. He said, I can't find anybody. He said, I, I would pay someone $50,000 a year tomorrow if I could find someone that could come in and take some of the burden off of me. He said, is, I just can't is, find So is it, a, is it a, gil, a skill gap? But what, what, it, what, Where's the root? There, there is a skill gap. Um, there, there's a perception out there that people don't know how to help someone else. But I also think there's, there's a management gap where we aren't willing to, to invest in people up front so they can contribute to our organization. Yeah, but, but the, even I go through that with my other company. If, if I invest, and, and, and it's a challenge, and I, I still do it. Trust me, I still send people to technical college and all that good stuff. But the, the, the risk is... I'm going to go find another job. I train them and then they move, right? And then I'm back to the beginning of where I'm at, where it's like, oh, okay, I got to find another <laughs> guy that I got to train. And I'm always against that, that brick wall. That's right. That's the, that's the reality that we're facing. And, and if you go back to its purest context, it, it, McDonald's got a hold of this early. They're the ones that realized that we are going to be living in a world of turnover. And that turnover is not something we can control. I was giving a speech for a large petrochemical plant a few years ago, and uh, I was signing some books at the end, and this young man comes to me, and he says, uh, he says, hey, John, he goes, so you, you live in Longview, Texas, right? I said, well, my offices are in Longview. I actually live close to Longview. He goes, well, I used to live in Longview, Texas as well. I said, really? He goes, yeah, I work for a large chemical plant, and I said, yeah, I know that plant very well. Um, I said, uh, no, wait a minute. I said, what do you do? He goes, I'm a chemical engineer. I said, how old are you? He said, 27. So I looked at him. I said, how old were you when you graduated from college? He said, 23. So I said, now let me get this straight. You're, you're 27 years old. You graduated from college three years ago, four years ago, and you've already worked for company A and B. And he looked at me and laughed. You know, I work for company C, too. Three companies in four years. So I asked him, I said, do you see a problem with that? And he literally looked at me like I was crazy and said, not really. He said, why would I hurt myself and stay if someone else is going to offer more? So, you know, what, what I'm realizing, organizations are, are living in this world that if, if, if I train someone, they're going to leave. Well, what's worse, not training them and keeping them? Yeah, you you got to keep training them absolutely. But the 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 turnover is a you know when I when I grew up and you know my dad worked for the utility company and he worked there forever and he retired and in all that good stuff. What I'm finding today is is and correct me if I'm wrong that people or the younger I, what age group? What are we talking about? Is is that a millennial? Is it or is that a Gen whatever? What 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 is it? So, so it's really funny. You know, the book that I published in 2011 called "Surviving the Talent Exodus" is about the generational change that was coming, and it was about it was all based upon the significance of a date one 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 January first. 2011. And, and at the time, as that date was approaching, nobody was talking about the significance of it. It was the year that the baby boomers started turning 65 years old. So that book that I published was about the storm that was coming. As the boomers exited and the millennials emerged, what havoc was that going to reach in our organizations? And it was so funny, Scott. Nobody really wanted to talk about it in 2011. The book was published in June. 2012, nobody wanted to talk about it, but I kept pushing and I kept 
encouraging companies to really think about this. 2013, that's when everything changed. It was when the switch came on for most organizations to realize we are seeing something that we never have seen before. And if you go back to the whole servant leadership thing, here's what I believe. When we had boomers who would stay with the same company for 20, 30, 40 years, they would tolerate bad supervision. They would tolerate that abusive yelling, cussing, and screaming supervisor. I saw it in the steel mill myself. They would tolerate those because their parents lived through the Great Depression, and they were told that you get a good job and you stick it out. You outlast the bad bosses. But what I tell people, those chickens have come home to roost. This millennial generation, they won't stay. You know, you hurt their feelings. You, you, you threaten them. You, you make them feel uncomfortable. If they, they'll, they'll disappear. They're like vapors here one minute and gone the next. And, and so they're they're willing to make a decision just in and from an organization. I, I my other company, Leaf Services, is a an industrial labor company, and I I don't deal with I, I deal with a a turnover rate. But but are you saying that that many of these, I guess blue no white collar, young professionals, they they'll just if, if it's not the right social message or or that boss looked at me funny or whatever, they're they're confident enough that they'll go and get another job. Is that I mean is that, Yeah, is I think that, that I think you that that's exactly it. They there's no perceived scarcity in employment for that young generation. And because there's not, they believe that, you know, I can I, I can coast for a little bit. I can live with mom and dad. I can get support. Mom and dad will let me live with them. I, you know, my own doctor, I was checking on his two boys. They're, they're in their early 20s. I said, what's going on with those boys? He said, they're living at home trying to figure things out. And they're in their early 20s. Jeez. That, that's a really – and I, I can only imagine what the companies are dealing – I mean, when, you, when you're responsible for thousands and, and you – the the your your HR background I can only imagine what those people are doing because it's a constant turnover and churn people coming in people leaving yep. and the messaging too and I would imagine just as a um, that there's 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 social platforms out there where hey uh, Joe Blow worked at this company and he left a message on Twitter saying they're bad people how do yeah. how, how does that company deal with that type of dynamic communication realities. Well, let me back up to the HR comment you made because yeah. I think that's really important. You know, I, in one of my books, I call it the, the HR dysfunction. You know, we are seeing as turnover increases, you know, through this new generation, we are seeing what I call the calcification of human resources, that they're becoming calloused and hard. And people in that environment, people are seen as a commodity, not as something special. And, you know, that, that brings wow. the tendency to get a, just a warm body into the plant. Wow. And, you know, so because the turnover is so high, you know, I've got a, a, a factory that I work with in Arkansas, a brand new factory, 1,200 employees. Their turnover is 167%. Holy, how do you even run a business that way? How do, how do you maintain continuity, uh, quality, you, 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 whatever? It, it is horrible. And, you know, they wanted to work on some initiatives. And, and I, I told them, I said, we can't do anything until we get your turnover under control. And, you know, that's that's the point at where, where we're at now. But you, we you did a root address. cause. You did a root cause. And you're saying, well, it's because of. Yes. For them, it's the environment and it's the it's the work. You know, it is it is a very uh, it's a very well-known industry yeah. um, that is known for this type of turnover anyway. Wow. Wow. So I'm a manager there, uh, John. I come to you and I'd say, oh, I'm having these challenges. Please guide me, direct me. Give me three points of wisdom that you can tell me what, what, what I need to do and, and tell me about it. Yeah. Well, I mean, the first thing I tell them to do is take a really honest look at themselves. You know, as a supervisor, as a manager, you know, how do you see your employees? Are they truly... Uh, your mission to to make them productive and to make them thrive, to make them healthy. Do you really see yourself in that light, uh, or you know, are you are you more traditional? Do you see yourself as having to force success or continuity through the people? 
you know, are you doing it for the people to become productive or are you doing it to make the people productive? You know, I, I, use, the, I use the farm analogy a lot. It, it, you can't plant a plant today and expect it to bear fruit tomorrow. You know, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. You know what the next best time is? No. Right now. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it, it, it's complex. If it were easy, they would have already solved the problem. I, I did some consulting work in and uh, in the utility space, and um, what they were challenged with was that it was a different, sort of a different HR challenge where the they went through a hiring boom back in whenever, and then nobody ever left. Everybody yeah. stayed within the utility, and then all of a sudden, everybody's ready to retire, and so there goes that knowledge out the door. And and many of the challenges was well how, how do you how do you how do you pull that knowledge out of that? Now it's just there's no knowledge. It just goes. Yeah. It's just like you said, vapor. Now you you mentioned traditional versus tribal. What what, right. what does that mean? So the whole purpose of my new book that I'm writing now, Leading the Tribes, is about helping organizations make the migration from transactional manager which is where we pay someone to do a job and they do a job to true tribal leaders. Tribal leaders see their role as different from a transactional manager. So you asked earlier, how do I make them see? Once I have them reflect internally, I have them look. I said, where do you see yourself? If, if this is transactional management on this side of the scale and this is tribal leader on this side of the scale, where do you see yourself right now? And very few will say, oh, I'm truly a tribal leader. Because if they do, they know I'm going to ask, okay, well, let's talk about what that really means. And, and, and what does that mean? Well, you know, a true tribal leader understands that the reason they work in your organization is bigger than the job itself. It's more than the work. I can be an accountant at this firm, this firm, or this firm. I can be an engineer at this firm, this firm, at this firm. You know, what I'm telling organizations going forward is, in today's reality, it's not what we do that matters. It's who we do it with. Those people are going to be forming social bonds you know, Seth Godin wrote a great book in 06 called Tribe. Well, Seth at that time didn't have the benefit of what social media was going to do to us as individuals. You know, as soon as we get off this podcast, you know, we're liable to check in with our tribes, our family tribes, our church tribes, our friends tribes. You know, we want to know how, how each other's doing. And organizations that don't, I think, build leadership understanding that, that, that there's a need to build a tribe at work, are going to be the ones that struggle while others succeed. And and it, you you've contributed a lot to trying to develop that that tribal mindset within organizations. Is that an accurate statement? Yeah, you, I mean, you think I mean, about the difference between being a warrior and being a soldier. You know, warriors are they're they're all in. They're committed. Yeah. Soldiers are just doing the job. That's a that's an interesting perspective. So it, it, so hold on to that. We're gonna we're gonna break. Please stand by. We are with uh, Mr. John Grubbs, a noted author. All good stuff. We're we're talking about uh, a lot of organizational challenges. So stand by. We will be right back. Hi, this is Scott McKenzie with Industrial Talk. I like to learn and I like to have fun. And when I can put them both together, learning and having fun, well, that's a match made in heaven. That's why I put together a drawing for Louisiana Fish Excursion, as well as the 2018 Mardi Gras Once in a Lifetime event. You can find more about this information, about this uh, two wonderful opportunities at the Industrial Talk website at industrialtalk.com. Welcome back. Scott McKenzie with Industrial Talk. I'm with Mr. John Grubbs. We're talking a lot about human resources, leadership, tribal leader, all of the stuff that challenges the um, businesses today. Um, John, we, we briefly, we talked about that uh, transactional versus tribal. We've looked at uh, looking at yourself, but you got to have that that senior management to reflect and say, "Oh, okay, whatever." I, I, yeah, I see where we're going. What are the key components there? The third one you talked about that uh, we mentioned was hiring sheep in the workplace. A expand upon that a little bit, if you don't mind. All right, you know, the, I, I use the I use the word sheep in, in a 
in a jovial way. It, it's a fun way of looking at people. But you, but you think about the attitude some organizations have when it comes to the human capital. You know, th- they really see people like sheep. You know, they back to your HR, them. your HR analogy, where it's just like it's it that it, it, they're just things. They're just cogs. That okay, they're coming and going, coming and going, coming and going, whatever. They're they're all alike. They're a commodity. You know, one human being is no different than the other. And what happens, and this is interesting, you know, there's research that I've done for the book that kind of correlates with the idea that the more bureaucratic human resources becomes, the higher the turnover seems to be. In other words, you know, the farther we are away from the actual hiring of human talent, the worse we get at choosing it. And then when we choose wrong... They don't stay, but, and, and our turnover actually increases. So think of it this way. If, if a large organization wants to Im- improve employee retention and you have people making decisions at the corporate level, which may be four or five levels or four or five states from where the hiring is actually taking place, there's no way to build that tribal connection with the human people that you bring into your organization. So th- there's a couple of things that I, I, I – that- have popped into my head. You're saying there's a commoditization of resources, which anything commoditized is just what what it is. It's a commoditization. Why have um, HR departments become more bureaucratic? What, what's uh, what's the genesis of that? I because as an old guy, I remember my dad could get me a job, and then yeah, my dad yeah. and it just and boom, boom, and it just happens. So what happened? So if, if I guess if you read my book, the biggest thing that I, I see as the dysfunction of human resources has come in its focus and its purpose. You know, there are two major, uh, I think, lines of thinking out there when it comes to HR. One, unfortunately, becomes dominant, and that's that we are here to protect the organization from litigation. In other words, we're here to keep people from suing us for, you know, wrongful termination, for discrimination. <clears throat> and if HR thinks, that way, it it has actually become a subordinate function of their legal department, a very legalistic view to human resources. And, you know, it it also gives them power at the board, at the the table with the board. Hey, we're here to keep this multi-billion dollar, multi-million dollar lawsuit from occurring so they feel like they have credit or credibility with the other players in the room. The, The opposite side of that is the HR professional who feels that their role is to help the organization attract and retain the best talent at all levels. And <clears throat> it, is, it is a little more touchy-feely, it's a little more soft, uh, but it is only going to be embraced or given, I guess, attention by senior managers who believe in that philosophy. Because it's real easy to say the justification of human resources is litigation prevention. The justification of human resources is to find attract and retain the best talent within our organizations. What I, what I tell leaders is you can't serve both masters. You lean one way or the other. Does that make sense? It, it does. And I, and, and I think that that uh, risk aversion mindset, it permeates all aspects of a company and, and operations too. It's not just, uh, it's not just from a human resource point of view, but I think that because of the necessity for proper safety procedures and so on and so forth everything is 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 geared toward that risk mitigation risk avoidance all of that good stuff yeah they, there's there, there's a little uh, truism a little axiom that I like to share with organizations you can't manage your way through this reality that we're facing you're truly going to have to lead. You're truly going to have to do things that are different because, you know, the, the individual does not have to work for your organization. You know, other companies are struggling with the same issues. And you, you saw this in the healthcare world where nurses went from hospital to hospital to hospital to hospital because no one was different. There was no differentiation. The, the yeah, there it is. That's, I, I you know, as, as a former manager and, uh, one of the challenges that, that I never really like dealing with, of course, is turnover. But it just seems today the manager has a tremendous amount of challenge when it comes to just and, – and, and I would imagine, too, it just it, 
goes into the safety. It's 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 risk mitigation, finding the right person to do the job, but then having that right person be able to do it effectively and competently without having the 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 other aspects of it. And then, of course, how that ripples through the organization. And I don't like working with John over here. I'd rather work with Susie over here. And so yeah. I don't want it because John is unsafe and Susie's great and all of that stuff. And, and, it, and it just grows and grows and grows and grows. Now, that's where you, John Grubbs, finds your sweet spot. That's, that's sort of where organizations, I mean, that, that's a heck of a issue. Well, you should see the look on a, on a manager's face when I tell them, you know, sometimes you have to create turnover to reduce turnover. You know, when I'm working with a frontline supervisor, and, and here's, an, here's another major flaw in our thinking that has brought us to this point in reality. You know, we have historically, especially in the manufacturing world, we promoted the best operator to become the supervisor. In other words, you know, Joe was the best at running this machine. Let's make Joe the supervisor. Well, it, it's a completely different skill set to lead a group of machine operators than it is to run a machine. Uh, but that's not how we promoted people in the past. You know, the, the professional sports is probably the best example of that. You know, how many of these athletes who are the best in the world at what they do, best human beings, you know, in their, in their sport, they're the best in the world. How many of those successfully make the migration from player to coach or player to manager? Very few. Very it's few. It's a different skill set. Yeah, yep. it's a different skill set. You know, so you should see a manager's, you know, look when I tell them, I said, your number one job is not production. It's not safety. It's not quality. I said, your number one job is to dehire those toxic bad attitudes from your team. And I call them cancers. They're organizational tumors in, in the companies that, that I work with. But then you're pulling in the HR again, and you've got that conundrum of you just can't let people go just because they look, they're bald like I am. They, you, you've got to have a reason, and you've got to create that, that for lack of a better term, case of why they yeah. need to go. And then by that time, time has passed. Click, 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 click. You've yeah. given this, that, and you've given that. And, and I, I, that's a challenge, too. Oh, that's the that's the fun part of this work, though. You start peeling back those bureaucratic layers to get to those tumors that are within those organizations. And, and I, I give them a hard time. I said, you've got two types of tumors in your organization. You've got benign tumors and you've got malignant tumors. I said, your benign tumors are going to hurt you. They're, they're going to make you uncomfortable, but you can deal with those and you can isolate those. Your malignant tumors are going to kill you. They're going to kill your organization. And heaven forbid, if you promote one of those malignant tumors into a supervisory or a management position, you know, the demise of the organization is, is extremely, extremely quick. You know, I, I'm working with a large organization where they, they have promoted a, well, actually they didn't promote, they hired, and, and people interview real well, a, a malignant tumor into a major, major role overseeing a lot of people. And the, the, migra the, the exodus has started. People started leaving that organization. People have exit strategies. And this individual is the classic narcissistic micromanager. You know? Lovely. <laughs> he, he, he cannot see his own problems. So once again, you're going to have to go in there. And you're going to have to cut out that malignant tumor. But, but that doesn't happen overnight. And as no. time goes on, it just keeps on, I don't know, yeah. it, it these are these are yeah it's the fun part but boy I'll tell you man it's it's the old days you know you could get rid of them and and they would yep. be limited but today's is that there's a, there's a there's a lot of structure and and a lot of truth with that too so what we're going to have to do there John we're going to have to wrap it up because I think that uh we've got another show coming up and we're going to talk a lot about and this is uh, for everybody that's on uh, industrial talk podcast right now uh and, and, and boy, I'll tell you, this is where John has these incredible insights into the organization. And, and this is to managers out there. Um, why? Why would anybody want to work for your company? And that I think that's another whole uh, topic that we're going to uh, jump on. So, John, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap all of this stuff up. And, uh, and I really appreciate your time, energy, and effort here. I know that, I mean, this is just incredible knowledge and, and wisdom out there. So thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. And uh, we'll get you back on the show ASAP. Thanks, Scott. Great talking it. to you. Yeah, yeah. 
I truly want to just thank uh, Mr. John uh, for being a guest on the Industrial Talk podcast. Truly enjoyed the conversation and truly enjoyed his insight into uh, organizations and uh, the challenges that uh, organizations have. If you like what you hear, definitely on the podcast, please, I would really appreciate it if you go out to iTunes and, and give me a thumbs up out there, write a comment. It is my lifeblood, and, and I appreciate uh, you listening. And to all, have a safe week as well as a wonderful day.